Hey you guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Marielle. This is Imperfectly Marielle. If this is your first time stopping by, thank you so much. If you are a returning subscriber, as always, thank you. Um, you are the reason why I'm continuing this. Um, I appreciate you so much. When I'm discouraged, I run into someone that lets me know that my story needs to be told. So I thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna jump right into this video. As always, um, here's the message or theory of the week. I saw this on a podcast a while back, maybe a month or two ago. Um, this this podcast is called Know For Sure. Um, it's B. Simone and her best friend, Megan Brooks. And while I'm not a huge fan of B. Simone, her best friend, Megan, is wise beyond her. Like, I, I could just listen to this girl talk. When she talks, she says something. Um, she is battling, like, mental health. I think she was diagnosed bipolar or something like that. And she's had like suicidal thoughts and all this stuff like she's openly sharing her mental health journey um on this podcast and one of the things that she said that just stayed with me was what if the one thing that you've prayed about that you have battled all your life because all her life she's battled mental health um, issues what if that one thing is the one thing that god is using to keep you close to him meaning this um disease that you've been fighting this thing that you have had just oh just over your head for years that you've prayed about and to no avail you feel like your prayers are not getting answered what if that's the one thing that is keeping you close to god now this is tricky because the way i understand god is that he's a god that answers prayers he's a god that wants all those good things for us he has good plans for us plans for us to succeed and do all these good things so why would god use something negative to keep us close to him and so at first i kind of was like mm, eh. but you know having dealt with something for years as um i have um thankfully it wasn't a disease or anything but i have dealt with this particular thing for years i've prayed for years about this one thing in my prayers i felt went went unanswered and so but it kept me praying it kept me on my knees it kept me close to god so what if that one thing what if that bad relationship with a significant other or or, or family or this disease that you can't shake or you know whatever it is if it's your financial situation you can't seem to shake it but you're constantly on your knees praying about it what if that one thing is what is keeping you in god's presence so Basically, the message was to, you know, accept your burdens and accept your 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 challenges. And, you know, you've been chosen for whatever reason to carry this cross. So basically to not accept it is a slap in the face for God. So um, I thought that was interesting. Um, still dealing with accepting it fully, but I absolutely think that it is interesting. And so with that being said, I want to segue into today's topic. My story is about doomsday, what I call doomsday. The day the sky fell, the day it all changed, the day my world got turned upside down. Um, and that is the day I was picked up. And who picked you up, girl? Who got a ride? I was picked up by Homeland Security, AKA ICE, AKA Immigration. And so I lived in an apartment in Queens, New York, um, where my aunt lived upstairs and I lived downstairs in the basement. Um, it's two separate apartments, but we worked it out to where we had access to each other's apartment, which in hindsight turned out to be a blessing. But um, we had this thing going on where, you know, I had access to go upstairs, she could come downstairs and the kids did as well. And so one Thursday morning in March, 2019, um, she got a knock on her door asking for me. And so she came down and was like, hey, these people are here to see you. It's 6.30 in the morning, I'd just gotten up. I'm getting the boys ready for school. Jordan was, my oldest was in high school. He was on his last year and the baby was like six years old. So I was making him oatmeal and I had already had him dressed. And so I get, you know, these people come through the door. There's about six or seven officers and it said police and they asked me to identify myself. And so once I said, yes, I am Marielle um, and walks a different type of officer, but his badge said ICE. Now, um, there's only one kind of ice that I like, <laughs> and that's the ice that refreshes. Um, when I saw him, I instantly kind of got this feeling of numbness over me. Now, I always knew I was undocumented for the longest, but I kept it very careful not to run into the, like that's your worst enemy if you're born in another country. If you're not American, ice is the devil. Like that's Goliath and you're not even David. Like that is that is the enemy. And so he comes in, I'm trying to play it cool, like, yeah, that's it's me, look what happened. 
and he basically was like you know my name is officer such and such and you are to come with us um these two female officers will accompany you to go inside and get dressed you have about five minutes um and let's go and so i was asking questions like well i have to be to work at 10 do you think this will be wrapped up before then and i remember when i said that question um one of the officers chuckled and he kind of was like <laughs> and it was then that i knew at that moment i knew um he basically was like, eh, we'll see. And so he advised me to dress warm. He told me to grab an ID and grab my phone. He allowed me to get my phone and told me to get some money. And so I get all this stuff and I remember my aunt coming down. She's disheveled. She's just like, what's happening? And I remember one of the female officers, once they got ready to like handle me, and I'll explain that, um, one of the female officers asked me if by any chance this woman, who she didn't know at the time was my aunt, would be able to take my child um, away. So he wouldn't see what was getting ready to happen to me next. And so I was like, yeah, that's my aunt. And so my aunt took my kid away and got him ready for school and got him on the bus. And getting me ready was um, shackling me, like literally shackles on my wrist, shackles around my waist, connected to my hands. So I was walking like I had just shot up a church or something um, and shackles on my feet. So I could only take steps that were so, you know, um, I remember asking if all this was necessary and they said, unfortunately, when we're dealing with any time you're a property of the federal government, this is how they transport you. So it was nothing. And, and to be honest, if this could have, if this was as pleasant as that situation could have been, they weren't rude, they weren't aggressive, but they were doing their job. And so the lady explained to me, you know, once you are a property of, you know, the federal government, this is how we have to transport you. People run, people fight, people, you know, so we have to do it this way. And so they escort me out of my apartment. Um, I remember turning back and watching my cousins who lived upstairs looking at me in complete disbelief. Um, my neighbors were outside. It was time when the sun was up. Kids was getting ready for, to go to school. Um, entire neighborhood watched me get carried away as if I had just murdered someone. So they put me in the back of a black charger. Again, they were about six cars deep. Um, they were, so at the time, I guess ICE had to be accompanied by police in case, because I guess people shoot at them, people fight. And so they had to be accompanied by police. So the officers got in their car and the ICE officers carried me away. Um, I remember getting on the highway, we went to Brooklyn, come to find out we were going to try, attempt to pick up another person, but this person was lucky enough to be at work that day or not home. And so um, he got away that day, not sure what ended up happening to him. And then we proceeded to go to Manhattan. And I remember seeing this really tall building um, that I probably never paid attention to before. I had been to Manhattan time and time again, never paid attention to it before, but that building was called Federal Plaza. Federal Plaza is where they process you in and out of the immigration system. And so we go into this building where there was just security on top of security. Um, you go into this garage where they close it before they let you out of the car. Um, there was officers that came down to, you know, get you up and they put you in this like freight type elevator. And once you got in the elevator, you went all the way up to the top. I don't know what floor it was. Um, just like secured police everywhere like armed people to your right and to your left like it was it was big business um we get into this place where all i noticed the first thing that caught my attention was metal they had a lot of metal they had metal benches metal toilets concrete um cells it was just it was cold it was really really cold we get in they ask us to take off our jackets they undid our hands had us take off our jackets um undo your shoelaces if you had sh um shoelaces on and um, take off our shackles and put us in this cold concrete um, cell where again, there was a metal toilet, a roll of toilet tissue, and that was it. Um, there were people laying there sleeping on the floor because I, I guess it just was that long of a process. And one by one, they called us out to go get processed. And so these people with paperwork, stacks and stacks of paperwork called us, had you identify yourself once again, asked you questions like, how did you come in? Um, when did you enter the US? Questions like that, which you're never coached for. Well, at least I know I wasn't. Um, it had been so many years before. I told them the best of my knowledge. I flew in, I was a kid. Um, they asked me various questions 
and then they go from there i feel like they knew the answers to most of these questions but they had to ask you to say like you are on record whatever you said would be used against you and so i answered um i remember at some point one of the female officers asked me if i was pregnant and i was like no and she was like well i noticed you have prenatal pills um vitamins on your nightstand and I was like, I, I take them for hair and nail growth. I don't know. I take, and she was like, oh, well, you almost got lucky. And I was like, do tell. And she was like, well, if you were pregnant, we couldn't keep you. We'd have to release you. And I was like, dang. And I was like, I knew I should. And so they kind of chuckled. And me being the jokester that I am, I, I remember turning to my left and I saw a young black dude. He was in charge of like taking your picture. And I was like, hey, buddy, what, what, what are you doing? Um, You got about 10 minutes? And they were like, what? And I was like, nah. she says, if I'm pregnant, you know, I could go. So, so give me like 10 minutes. And I just remembered them laughing. I had the whole room laughing. Here I am facing the biggest challenge of my life. And I'm over here joking. And I turned to my left and I saw this big white dude. And I'm like, what's up with you? I'm like, hey, what's up? You, you got 10 minutes? I was like, I promise. All I need is about 10 minutes. And they're cracking up. But I'm dying inside. I knew this was this was the beginning of something i didn't know how deep it was going to be but i knew this was the beginning of something major but as always i laughed through my pain and so they all joked and they allowed me to use the phone i called my friend i called my aunt and um after that they sent me back to my cell where i waited what seemed like an eternity um fell asleep woke up they give you bologna sandwiches and then after that, um, about 5 p.m., they call us all out and they export us. They take us back to um, the same freight elevator, back into like a paddy wagon, and then they're transporting us somewhere. And so that somewhere ended up being um, Hudson, New Jersey, where they were going to house us for however long your fight was going to be with immigration. Because um, when you were doing, you know, getting processed, they explained to you that um, this is the government challenging your stay in the US, um, you are here, um, the government doesn't agree with the terms in which under which you're here, and so they're challenging that. So you now will have the opportunity to get a, a lawyer to prove that you deserve and you belong to uh, in the US. And so that was the fight ahead. And so once, but once they picked you up, you could not be at home fighting this. You now had to be detained while you proved your allowed to stay in the u.s and so that was the fight ahead and so we get in this paddy wagon we drove about 45 minutes um and now we're in a jail hudson county is a jail where they have a part like a side that is dedicated to immigration and so they took us to that side you still had to be processed go through medical do everything like that all of which took i got to a bed a bunk bed and i use the term bed like because <laughs> I got to a bed. They picked me up at 6.30 in the morning. I got to a bed 5 o'clock the following morning. So, morning. so the entire process took almost 24 hours. And a lot of that time, you're just sitting and waiting. Once you are property of the state, property of the government, your time no longer matters. They are not in a rush for you. You are on their clock. It, it is absolutely just, you're just like, I have things to do. They're like, no, you don't. Um, and so they moved me up to a bunk bed. Um, I remember being really, really cold, really tired. And um, there was one officer, Officer Jones. She'll probably never see this video, but we got a place right here. Um, gave me a blanket and kind of wrapped me in it. So sorry, guys. I needed to take a moment. Um, there are still parts of this story that is just really difficult to get through without me getting emotional so just bear with me and forgive my editing yeah so she wrapped me up in this blanket and she basically was just like you know what it's gonna be okay and she saw the fear in my eyes and she saw how you know I, I'm, I'm sure she's used to seeing people come in and just not know what's gonna happen next but she was so kind um she was one of one of very few because not all of them was that way um so i hadn't seen her again maybe maybe like one other time for my 10 months in there because um that's another story time but um she i had never seen her again and so when i saw her the next time i jumped up and hugged her she's like you'll get me in trouble and i just couldn't help it she was just one of those people that that just you know was positive and was loving and so but yeah that was um that was doomsday that was the day i got picked up and so drop down in the comments let me know if you're anybody who's been through this let me know if you um how you feel how you feel about my story time let me know if you feel like i deserved it you don't even know how i got here but let me know 
how you feel. Let's have a conversation. As always, thank you for your support. Thank you for your ear. Thanks for listening me to me vent. And um, let's have a conversation. And as always, I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.